So if you haven't seen or heard, there was a very interesting interview last week on the Cross Politic podcast with Pastor Jonathan Lehman. Now, if you don't recall, Pastor Lehman is the guy who wrote an article in response to John MacArthur's statement from late July, early August, when Grace Community Church in L.A., California, had put out a statement saying, the government is, is telling us we can't meet, we are openly defying that, they don't have that right, they can't tell us to say Tuesday shut down, we're going to meet no matter what. And very shortly thereafter, I think within a week, an article an article was released on Nine Marks by Pastor Lehman, which tried very hard to look like it was just offering a different option, but I saw and many others saw this as pretty much being a refutation of what the, of what the Grace to You elders were trying to say. Not like openly refuting, but it seemed like all the say everything he gave was a complete opposite argument to what the Grace to You statement said, which, as you can imagine, caused a pretty big stir in the conservative evangelical world as to whether or not we should be meeting for church or should be listening to the government. Now, Pastor Lehman was gracious enough to come on the show. I would imagine knowing he was going into somewhat hostile territory. The cross-politic guys have not hidden where they stand on this subject. They are very much in favor of going to church and saying the government can't tell you to stay shut down. Now, this was a very civil conversation. The cross-politic guys didn't try to, like, trap him or give him a gotcha question, but they did ask tough questions. And, like with the article, I found a lot of Pastor Lehman's answers to be wholly inadequate, just thinking, okay, I know where you're trying to go, but that doesn't apply, or it just, it is, I mean, basically, it wasn't an answer to the question. It seemed to try to defer and move the target away and not actually answer the question. Now, if you want to see the whole thing, I would highly recommend it. I will have a link for it down in the description, but right now, what I want to do is just play a few clips from this. There are a few points that stood out to me. It made me think like, okay, this is one of the reasons why this interview and this article bothered me so much. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this up now. Okay, and this is about probably, I think, five, six minutes into the interview itself. So they've already talked somewhat. They, like, uh, Lehman has been asked the question point blank, does the government have the right to shut down MacArthur's church? And... The answer has pretty much been, well, it depends, and each church is going to make that up, going to make that call for themselves. But what I'm going to play here first is there was a point that Pastor Lehman made in his article that didn't sit with me very well, and his and his and his explaining it here didn't do much to clear it up. But anyway, let's go ahead and uh, jump right in. Remember um, that you and uh, Pastor Dever, who I love, every time I go to D.C., I've visited y'all's churches on my business trips and everything. So I, I really uh, appreciate um, Mark also and your church, your church. I love your worship service and all that stuff. Um, uh, but I, if I remember correctly, you and Mark had a podcast where you guys were kind of talking about how you would not spend the kind of cultural capital that John MacArthur spent on on kind of making some of the decision that he made. Um and I, I don't. I don't remember that. I remember saying that in my article. I, I don't remember that. I don't not remember that part of the conversation. But yeah, let me. Yeah. 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 I, yeah I, sure. Because I, I said that in my article. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My point there was uh, recognize that making a judgment. I mean, frankly, I mean, it, it's like anything else a pastor does, right? You recognize that you have a certain amount of capital to spend. Let's suppose you're you're, you're dealing with a a troubled marriage, right? A, a sure. A husband and a wife who are angry at each other. They're each blaming the ch uh, each other. You, you got to kind of step through that situation wisely. And you kind of have your own assessment of who's to blame in this problem, but yeah, yeah, you're not, you're not entirely positive. And you know, you got to have to push back on both of them. You know, you have to be careful how much you ask of each of them when in moving them towards a repentance where it's necessary, or B, reconciliation, right? So pastors are always making those kinds of judgment calls. Like, okay, do, do I have the capital right now to require this of the woman or the man? Or is that just going to harden their hearts or they're going to pull back? I mean, pastors are doing this all the time. 
Uh, and I think my point then with this was, friends, recognize we're going to have plenty of occasions to stand up against the government and recognize also that spend a little capital here, you're going to have less capital there. Mm -hmm. uh, so make sure, you know, just be careful before you decide which hills to die on. It, it right? seems Not like all hills are worth dying on. Yeah. Just yeah. be so what I got from this and what at least stuck out to me was that idea of cultural capital. It seems like in this example, he is comparing, not comparing, he's using like capital and influence as synonyms, at least in this context, where well, the church only has so much influence with the world around it. And if you take a stand here, that's going to give a certain look to the world around you, and is that a hill worth dying on? Granted, that's a relevant question. We do make those kind of calls all the time. But what stuck out as being just really weird in this case was, well, first, the example that he gave. I mean, I would think if you have a couple coming to you for counseling, those are members of your church, or at least they have made some kind of declaration in by coming to you for help to submit to your authority. Granted, doesn't mean they will listen to everything you say, and just go with whatever you tell them. I understand that. However, that example exists in a completely different category. That is a couple coming to the church for help. The world is not coming to us. The culture is not coming to the church, at least in most cases. What normally happens is we go into the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, and teach them to obey all that Christ has commanded, and that then goes out and influences the culture. So, in this instance, when the question is, well, do the gov well, do, does the government have the right to tell churches you cannot meet, and you get that kind of an example, it just, it didn't, it's a, it didn't work with me. I thought, mm, you're mixing categories here, and it may work in a broad general sense, but let's stick with what the question is at hand and give tangible answers. The other thing that bugged me on that was, this idea, well, let's be careful how we spend our cultural capital, that sounds way too much like, well, let's not do what's going to make people mad and thus hurt our witness. I mean, I've heard that justified for pretty much anything. I mean, think about this. How many mainline denominations have completely caved on the cultural demands for delowing, or delowing, wow, allowing, rather, same-sex marriages to be seen as actual marriages? How many churches have expanded the true definition of marriage to include same-sex couples? I mean, after Obergefell versus Hodges in June of 2015, when the Supreme Court came down and said, well, we're going to, in essence, make a brand new law that overrules all the state-level laws and says you must include same-sex couples in your definition of marriage. Now, they didn't say it was a new law because they can't do that. They know they don't have that power, but effectively that's what it was. And all of the, all of the elected officials who are supposed to be lawmakers who are writing and passing laws pretty much just rolled over and accepted that. Even the Republicans, even the ones who were more conservative, who were fighting for the definition of marriage prior to this ruling, now since then have pretty much just caved and given up on it. Think about it. When's the last time you saw a Republican representative either on the floor of the House, on the floor of the Senate, or just in their own home state, in any public context, talk about how marriage needs to be defined as one man, one woman, and nothing else? I can't think of one. Now, if there are some out there, wonderful, good for them, keep fighting that fight, but as a whole, even the more conservative side has pretty much caved on that. And that also pertains to churches as well. I mean, how many mainline denominations have now talked about, well, we need to be more open and we need to be loving to this group because, well, if we do, say, well, if we die on that hill, they're not going to want to listen to us. So say that that's going to hurt our witness. Like, you can use that to justify anything. There comes a time where you need to die on that hill, and dying on a hill should not be determined. Well, how is the world going to see this? Is this going to make conversations harder? It should be. This is what God's Word says. This is where He tells us to stand. Are we going to stand there? Now, let me just say, I understand that what I just drew out and what Pastor Lehman's talking about 
not the same thing. As far as I know, Pastor Lehman's church does stand on the traditional definition of marriage. Good for him. That's great. That's what we should be doing. However, my thought when, with hearing this was, well, if you're not going to die on this hill, when are you? One other thing we've seen all too often is whether it's church leaders or elected officials, the idea is, well, we're going to have plenty of opportunities to stand, so let's not fight this fight, but the next one. Then it's, well, not that one, but the next one. Not that one, but the next one. I mean, say, that can just keeps getting pushed further and further down the hill. You're setting a precedent to where you don't want to take a stand because it's going to cost us in a uh, culturally. Basically, we are going to lose some cultural influence for standing up for things that God says, you know, so when God says do this and the culture says no, do this instead, and we take on God's side, or we stand on God's side, that is going to cause the culture to dislike us. And we're told that's going to happen. So this whole idea is like, well, let's not waste our cultural capital on this. Look, I, like, I hesitate to say the word compromise, but that's what comes to mind. That is kind of what that sounds like. So, anywho, uh, that's a, I could say a... I could say much more on that, but I would ramble on for much, much longer. Let's just move on to the uh, the, the next clip here. Be careful to make sure you know when it's time to die on the shelf. And I guess... Well, church, church on Sunday morning would actually be a hill I'd be ready to die on. <clears throat> well, see, I, see but, that's, but that's, not what the, that's not what I contested. What I contested was, I said, certainly Christ's church in some form or fashion, and I would even say on Sunday, should meet... Does it have to meet that in that building at this time with all the membership? And that's where I said, okay, we, we can be a little flexible. I'm not, okay, how are we going to cut this diamond? And the way I'm contesting in the article, or the original article, is we, we don't have to cut it right here, which is we have to meet in this building altogether. Well, no, we, we could find other ways to meet. So, yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with you, Knox. I think Christians should do all they can. Okay. We can find other ways to meet, but why? Now, what he's going to go into here is like, well, his church meets outside. They meet in a field because they normally meet in an elementary school. The schools are closed right now, so they're meeting outside. Okay, that's fine for August, September. What about January? Or what about February? Like here in Iowa, we get some pretty cold winters. I mean, a winter day, it can be 10 degrees or negative 10 degrees. And they can follow each other in a single week. Like, you can have a 20-degree Tuesday and a negative 15-degree Wednesday. That's just standard here. So are you supposed to keep meeting outside in that kind of a context? Or, you say, or he also points out in his article, well, what about meeting in homes in smaller groups? Like, do we really, like, like, do we really have to do that? Are we pushed to that point right now because of the coronavirus? Like, we get why a place is over in China. We get why those churches are meeting in smaller groups because it is illegal to be a Christian over there. Like, if you meet in large groups, you will go to jail. If you preach against the state, you will go to jail. However, they found some loopholes that the state really doesn't care if smaller groups meet together. I think, it, I think he said in the article that if it's groups that are less than 100... The police really just don't care. They're just going to leave them alone. So they've met up in smaller groups. Okay, I get that for China. That, absolutely, the church can still meet that way. But just because we can, does that mean we should? I mean, it gets back to, does the state have the right to say you cannot meet in this building? Going with this kind of idea, like, well, we can meet in other ways. Isn't that in a way conceding that they have that authority? And they can tell you that you can't meet in that building. Okay, what happens when they come after the smaller groups? Or what? Or what when they say, "Oh, wait a minute, you can't actually meet outside, or you can't meet on public property for a church service." Are we going to just accommodate with that too? I mean, that seems to be the question here: is like, where do you actually take a stand? If you're not going to take a stand here, when are you? Like you heard him saying, like, well. We're going to have plenty of other opportunities. Yeah, well, just because we'll have plenty of other opportunities doesn't mean you don't take a stand now. Like, if you don't take a stand now, when are you going to? Like, I get that as LGBT becomes greater and greater and greater, there's that threat. But 
If you're not going to take a stand now, why would you take a stand then? And even if you do take a stand then, is that cultural capital still going to be worth what it was before? I mean, my thought is with like LGBT itself, that influence is dwindling away and us hanging on to it and waiting to spend it at some other time is not going to preserve it. It gets back to the idea, well, we can do this, but are we, but do we need to? Does the government have the right to say you have to do it this way and we just give no pushback, but just seek ways to accommodate? That's one thing that just, it seems like that really wasn't touched by Pastor Lehman in this, but we'll carry on. And together. Absolutely. Are you guys meeting and gathering together right now, Jonathan, you, at your church? Have you guys decided to yeah, do we that? Yeah, we meet, we meet outside, outside, kind of in a field right next to Green Belt Baptist Church. They've kindly provided their space. We ordinarily, we're a church plant. We ordinarily meet in an elementary school. And since the elementary school shut down entirely since March or whenever, we've had to go elsewhere. And so right now we're meeting in a field next to Green Belt Baptist Church at 8 a.m. <laughs> so right in early. So part of, I guess part of my question is still kind of going back to John MacArthur, not to pick on those guys or to kind of make that the focus, but because trying to work through a few things, and I think they're right in the center of it, so it's helping us work through kind of a, a, a litany of different things here. When, when they decided to go ahead and make the decision that what they see happening with COVID-19 not really being as deadly or as a threat. A threat, there. as the federal, as the government has said it was, and they decided to meet. Did the federal government still have the authority to regulate their services? The way I understand authority is that no human authority has absolute authority. God alone has absolute authority. All human authority is necessarily relative, right? right. Authority is, is, is something that we don't possess intrinsically. It's something that we are given. And the government is given authority for certain times and certain places. Right. And throughout life, and many times, various authorities come into contradiction, Right. So yeah. I, I use the example, I think in an article, maybe another article, the state says you're abusing your child and you're saying, no, I'm only spanking my child. Well, one of them is right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so there's a sense in which at any moment in which two authorities come into conflict, there's, there's no final on earth, at least, you know, they're right or they're sure. right. Sure. It all sort of fits on the, the, the final judgment. So what we have in this moment is, is two authorities, the church and the state, coming increasingly into contact yeah. or a uh, uh, conflict. Yeah. Right? And in, in one sense, Knox, the final result, you ask me, is it right? Or do they still have the authority? And I'm kind of like, well, you know, that's going to finally be revealed on the last day. And each church is going to have to make a judgment for itself about how we are to act right now. So, you know, my church is going to make one assessment, one judgment. Yours might make a slightly different one. But let me, let me, let me answer your question this way. Please. Potentially. Yes, they still have that authority. The church, the state does, that is. Potentially, no, they do not. I, I, I'm just going to insist on the possibility of both, and I'm not going to say necessarily yes or necessarily no. But wouldn't it be... The only? Okay, I just have to stop and say, this may come off a little strong, but the only term I can think of to really describe that answer is cop-out. Think about what was asked. It was a very pointed, direct question. Does the government in this case right now in California have the right to tell Grace Community Church with John MacArthur and all the other elders, you must stay shut down, you cannot meet in this building? Do they have that right? That was the question that was asked. What you got was a vague answer about, well, here is the nature of authority. One's right, one's wrong. We won't know until the last day. And then and then just left vague. And it's like, well, potentially yes, potentially no. Like, okay, that's not an answer. Like, describing what authority is and not asking a direct question. Well, given that, now granted, like, I understand that. Well, let's start with defining what authority is on a broader, more general scale. I'm fine with that, but he never brought it around to what he was actually asked. He stayed in the realm of vague general categories and said, well, maybe yes, maybe no. And one thing, and actually one thing that's going to be pushed on him right now is like, well, wait a minute, you're, you are a pastor. You're supposed to be leading. Shouldn't you be saying yes or no? So I think that's up next. Let's see. The final judgment is going to reveal which of those two was right. But wouldn't it be your duty as a pastor to clear, clearly 
um, show your sheep how uh, what the situation is in your congregation yeah. in that moment in that time to yeah. say the yeah. the government is wrong. Well, if uh, yeah, if if you and your fellow elders believe it's the, the state has overstepped or been unjust and where it's stepped, yeah, absolutely. That, that is your duty as a pastor to do so. I'd like to go back a little bit to... And once again, it stays in the area of vague general categories. Well, if you determine that to be the case, then yes, that is your job as a pastor to do so. Okay, that's what they've done. That's what John MacArthur and the elders at Grace Community Church have done. Now, do you think that is wrong? Like, Or do you think they made a mistake? Now, again, with the article... Every, it's like every reason he gave was, well, we can do things differently. We don't have to do it just this way. But now when he's being questioned, it's like he's demanding to stay in vague general categories and not give direct answers. And that that really gets under my skin. It's like, OK, you've written in opposition to this and maybe you aren't fully opposed. You can sit, you know. We can still have unity, but have very severe disagreements on things. So if you disagree, just disagree. <laughs> like, it doesn't mean you're against the man entirely. It just, just, that's what I kept, I kept getting over and over here. It's like, I'm not going to answer questions directly. I'm going to stay in more comfortable general categories and tell everyone, hey, make your own call. And I guess there's a place for that, but at the same point in time, just when you're asked a direct question, give a at least somewhat direct answer. That seems to be just logical to me. Now, I've said much more than I planned on saying originally on this one point, and I could go on. There are still other points that were just as problematic. There needs to be things said about those as well. I may come back and do a separate video on those later on by themselves. But for now, I'm just going to leave this where it's at. Uh, I Once again, I do highly recommend watching the entirety of the video. I will have a link down in the description. But for now, I hope you found this helpful and you have a great day.